obviously quite a crowd. Welcome, everybody. Um, for those of us who have ventured into the world of cruising, we will know only too well how uniquely special it is to arrive at your destination by boat, under your own steam, the lovely sense of self-sufficiency when you finally you drop the anchor and you put the kettle on. Nothing beats that. But how many of you here have contemplated doing all that in a dinghy? I'm suspecting actually quite a few. <laughs> That's quite an undertaking. Well, you, if you haven't thought about it, you're very much about to be persuaded. Let's welcome Roger Barnes to the stage, who's going to talk about his latest dinghy cruising adventures and share his top tips for those getting ready for another summer of cruising. Welcome, Roger. Thank, Thank you. you. Hello, everybody. <laughs> oh, gosh, that happened even without me doing it. Right, with far too many slides. Um, the idea is I talk for half an hour, rush through the slides, and then we have questions and answers, so you can say what you want. Um, and hopefully this is all going to work. There we go. This is me um, a long time ago, when I was about eight. I'm the person rowing. Um, I had a sort of Swallows and Amazons childhood. Um, we spent virtually every third weekend in a little um, flat on the shores of Windermere. Um, so that's me and my brother in a heron dinghy and the old, what these were considered to be big, expensive flash pack cabin cruisers back in the day, these little things. And the Westerly 22 in the distance I thought was just the epitome of yachting. I couldn't imagine ever being able to afford a yacht as big as that. Little Westerly 22, which of course nowadays would be considered a really small yacht. So, um, dinghies, we're of course all into dinghies, um, so we can make a little pop at the opposition. This is my dinghy and my car on a slipway in La Rochelle, and this is the largest, it's called Les Minimes, it's the largest marina in Western Europe, um, and obviously you can see I'm sharing the slipway with another boat. Um, I, I, you know, it's what it, it is whatever rocks your boat. You know, if, if you find pleasure in having a big white yacht and keeping it in a big marina, well, you know, it's, it is fine. But there is, is something, I'm afraid, as, as the world changes and we know about environmentalism and, and the impact of, of our modern lifestyle, there is something depressing about big marinas and the whole sense that if you want to go cruising, you have to have a white yacht and it has to have and it has to have an indoor bathroom and an ensuite and a shower and hot and cold running water and all these things. No, no. We are here to say there is another way. So this is my boat, which you saw on the slipway. This is a little closer to. Um, it is a little different in feel than a lot of the boats in this hall because it is a cruising boat rather than a racing boat. And we... We were talking actually on our stand, which is just over there, just over there, um, about performance. There is this whole idea about performance dinghies, and we said, well, performance is about fitness for purpose. And if you go cruising, your criteria of what performance is is very different, and it's actually a lot to do with comfort and practicality, and a bit less to do with ultimate speed. And you start looking at the sorts of priorities that fishermen had back in the day in sailing fishing boats, they would, um, you know, it's very much the same sort of set of criteria that you have. So very often cruising dinghies do look like old-fashioned fishing boats. This is the, obviously the plan and section of my dinghy with all the gear that you need to go cruising. It's in French because um, I had to produce illustrations for a French magazine. But um, all we really need to say is you have to sort of try and be organized. But, uh, and put, I was thinking someone was waving at me, she's waving at somebody else. Um, yes, we shall move on. Dinghy choice. Right, so this is, what is a dinghy? What is a dinghy? Now, that's an interesting question, I think. If you read Treasure Island, they, there's a whole bit where they're, 
the, you know, the, 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 uh, the baddies, the pirates of the gigs, and the goodies have this little thing called a jolly boat, and the jolly boat eventually gets sunk by gunfire from the Hispaniola, which has been taken over by the pirates. A jolly boat was the smallest boat carried by a ship. You know, boats are obviously things that are carried on ships. And um, around about the 19th century, eight, late 18th century, jolly boats started being called dinghies. And this here is a, um, from a naval manual of seamanship, is what a naval dinghy looked like. Sort of 16 foot long, fairly heavy boat, fairly small sail area. And that was the beginning of what a dinghy was. And we started in Britain using the word dinghy. Very difficult to translate into a foreign language because they don't have the concept of dinghies. That's what a dinghy was. And interestingly, a boat like that is still really good for cruising. Quite heavy, small sail area. Also, you will notice um, if you go cruising, you actually start thinking about different rigs. Bermudan rigs are not necessarily where it's at. I don't have a Bermudan rig. But a very popular cruising dinghy is the uh, Wayfarer. And these are cruising Wayfarers. And uh, you'll see they have strange things hanging from their sails because they have the ability to reduce sail area. Really important for cruising. And it's one of the main things that starts happening if you go cruising is you're interested in, you don't want all that sail up there all the time. That's near Swanage actually sailing down the coast. This is in Pool Harbour, a couple of wayfarers stopping on an island. It's dinghy cruising, it's what you do. You sail somewhere like Shirley was saying and you stop and you have a brew. And um, we're still in ding we're talking about choice of boats here. This is a choice of boats bit. Um, and as I was saying, so you can have wayfarers. Also, there are various people doing uh, replicas of rather more traditional dinghies. Um, this is uh, Roger Wilkinson who makes this boat. That's actually him and his dog. There is uh, a guy called John Wellsford who designs boats in New Zealand. This is actually in New Zealand. And this is uh, Francois Vivier, who actually designed my dinghy. He produces a more modern dinghy now called the Man Ouet. And uh, there are a few of them on a beach. There is, uh, the thing is that actually once you start getting into cruising, because there are fewer of us doing it, there aren't really the mass-produced boats in quite the same way. So a lot of us have uh, short-range boats, you know, that are built by small boat builders and often in timber. This in Utrecht in Scotland has got a famous designer of cruising dinghies. This is something called the Ness Yule, very beautiful dinghy. And obviously Drascom, or I should say Devon, because Devon are here. Drascom and Devon are sort of the same, it's complicated. But this is a Drascom longboat, really, really good boats. You see them all over, you know, the British coastline, they're sturdy boats, they can be kept on moorings. They've got a really good way of putting the outboard in. People say, how do I get into dinghy cruising? And I do have to say, one of the easy ways is buy a Drascom or a Devon. Devon. Two companies make them, you see, and one called them Drascom, one called them Devon. Or a mirror dinghy. This is David Sumner's mirror dinghy. He cruises in the Solent. He's re-rigged his mirror dinghy. It's plywood mirror dinghy as you can see with a gaff sail. He actually cut the main sail in half and made a gaff sail, and then he has a top sail. And he sleeps on board, and he goes all over the Solent. So you can even, you can pick up a mirror dinghy for sort of 300 quid. It's maybe less. Nights away. So the point about dinghy cruising is we in the, we in the Dinghy Cruising Association are trying to create slogans, and we have this slogan that we're to do with everything other than racing. And we think that's a bit, it sounds like we're a bit anti-racing. And we're not anti-racing, so, but it's just that we're trying to define ourselves as what we are. And we have, we've been talking about maybe we should say beyond racing. Beyond racing. Yes, and one of the things that really takes us beyond racing is that we do sleep aboard our boats. Um, we don't all do that, but it is a really nice thing to do. So nights away, so you find a reasonably stable dinghy and you create some sort of boat tent 
and you go up to some nice creek into the wilderness. And the lovely thing, as soon as you do this, you don't need to get home. It makes the whole of sailing much more relaxed because you can sort of set off. And um, if the wind is against you or the tide doesn't do, well, the tides do what? The lovely thing about tides is they always do what's expected, but sometimes, you know, the wind over tide effect might be a bit much and you think, oh, I don't want to go through this horrible race. We'll nip in here, this little creek there, that looks interesting. And you can sort of go in and put the tent up and you know, just spend the night there and wait for conditions to improve, which is how people did in the past. In the great days of sail, people waited for fair winds. They didn't go plunging on. This is the problem, fault of the modern world. Plunging on against the elements, you have to start saying, I'm going to respect the elements and, and work with them. So um, this is me. Um, so you can do this anywhere. The lovely thing is, in a cruising dinghy, what you do is you find a beautiful view and you just effectively erect your tent in the middle of it. It is perfectly legal. This is Ditsum on the River Dart. You see, there's this nice row of cottages. Hitherto, they had this really attractive view of the estuary, and now they've got to look at a cruising dinghy. This is inside my boat, which, as I say, is on the stand just around there. Um, I, there is a sort of box for a, a cooker, and there is a box for the food, and then, there's, as you can see, there's a sleeping bag, and there's various bits of gear tied down. The thing about, obviously, a cruising dinghy is that some of the time it's a house with the tent up and you live there, and then other times there's waves breaking over and, you know, and it's all doing this and you need to actually be able to take the sail down and reef and relate to, you know, head off disasters at sea, really. And the last thing you want is cups and saucers rolling around the bottom boards while you're doing that. So, you know, the trick is to have, you know, it's the old place for everything and everything in its place theory. So being organized and also having an ability to take all the gear out. Um, you know, my galley box and food box can be taken out of the boat, you know, very easily and stocked up at home and then put in the boat. And then it's, yes, it's the, just more in the middle of a view. So I stopped here. This is the Ile d'Air on the north coast of Brittany. Um, I had had a little exciting experience just before this, and I came racing in here, dropped the anchor, and then this is just before I put the tent up. This is a couple of wayfarer sailors doing a similar thing, so they've put their boom up like that, and they're just about to put the, uh, the tent cover up. That's a back creek up above Solcombe. And another wayfarer with the tent up, look. Children like dinghy cruising, much less boring than being in a yacht. This is um, a Warham catamaran with a big tent, and uh, John Hughes there, um, his wife and two children, had there was space for them all to camp aboard. The, the catamaran is a 16 foot catamaran. Umbrellas, yes, the, the thing about dinghy cruising is there's we do buy specialist kit from people like Messrs. Gill or Harkin, but also it's amazing how other things like umbrellas come in very handy if you're in a dinghy. And one of our members realized that umbrellas were such a clever bit of technology that he actually made a boat tent out of two umbrellas so he could just go whoop and then the other one. And um, yes. It's, like, it's almost like foiling moths. It's this sort of whole sense of innovation the whole time, you see. And the other thing that the great, this is what suddenly pop-up tents have taken the dinghy cruising world by storm. You can pick these up for sort of 20 quid or so. So you sort of have some sheets of plywood and you slide them across your boat to create a level platform. And then you erect your pop-up tent. This is a skipper dinghy, which is they were popular in the 60s. They can you know, be picked up for virtually nothing. And there you are. There's your cruising dinghy. And um, if you don't even want to do that, the other way of dinghy cruising, very quick way in, is actually simply to buy a land tent and always go somewhere where you can camp ashore. 
This is a place called Porth Clas near um, St. David's in Wales. There's a little harbour there. And you can see three wayfarers have gone in. They've set about halls for their boats and put their tents on the, on the bank there. That's another picture. I said I had too many pictures. This is, oh yes, if you make your, the other thing, innovation in dinghy cruising, if you start making your own perfect cruising dinghy, what you really realize very quickly is the trick is to be comfortable. And as long as you're comfortable, everything else falls into place. As I say, ultimate windward performance actually stops being quite as important. So um, this little boat, which is called the Flying Pig, and its proud owner there is basically a floating double bed. So he started with the bed. He thought, well, and comfort is a double bed. And he sort of bent a boat around it. You see, he's got this mattress, and he's got a locker for his cooker, and he's got this nice padding round so he can lounge, you see, against a padded stand. And it really isn't the fastest of boats. But as soon as you've gone cruising and you realize, you know, you're out there and it's wet and it's windy and you arrive somewhere and there's some waves on the bar and you get up a creek and you want to just be, be comfortable and just relax. So, yeah, a boat that's comfortable to live in. Techniques. Yeah. This is where we get a bit combative, you see. I'm not certain that if you go racing, you know as much as we who go cruising. I think you know an awful lot about making boats go fast and tactical advantages at the windward mark. And there's all sorts of other stuff that comes into play if you take a boat along the coast, um, like coiling a rope and throwing it. And of course, reefing, which we sort of mentioned before. This is actually a wayfarer with one reef in the sail. And you can maybe see halfway up the sail, there's the ability to take another reef in. That's again off Old Harry near Swanage. And um, so, yes, you see, we look around and we don't see ability to reef. Ability to reef, it should be on all boats. There is a cruising wayfarer somewhere. I lose track of where everything is in the entrance hall. And you will very much notice ability to reef. It's what sets apart as cruising boats. This is my boat again. I have three, the ability to three reefs in my main sail. I only have one sail. And this is me with all three reefs in. So that's the, you know, the sail reef right down, sort of sailing along the coast. Really does make things a lot less stressful, simply reducing sail area, as opposed to racing along with full sail up. Yeah, rowing. People have gone off rowing, and I think it's rubber dinghies. It's the rubber dinghies people have for yachts, and they think rowing is difficult. It isn't. It, it, the difference between having an outboard in a dinghy and operating by sail and oar is profound, and I think it's a spiritual one. But also, it's actually about exercise. We all need exercise. People go to gyms, and they sit on rowing machines. But if you row in the open sea, we in our boat, we have this thing that if we want, if we ever want to tow, we're thinking, oh, maybe occasionally we do allow people to tow us, you know, because we're not proud, really. The quickest way to do it is to take the sail down and start rowing. And you can, you can be in this empty expanse of water, and suddenly boats will appear from all directions because you clearly need assistance, because people don't row in the open sea anymore. But it's a really nice way of moving a boat along. Um, this is on the River Ornes. This is my boat, and we're rowing on the... That's the River Tamar. And here is a diagram. This is the technical bit of the talk. The point about rowing is simply to learn how to do it properly and set up a rhythm. And it's then like walking. You can actually row all day as long as you don't tie yourself out. But you have to have the technique and you have to have proper long oars. My oars are 11 foot long. So my boat is 15 foot long, I have 11 foot long oars. And if you look at photographs of sailing fishing boats of the last century, you'll find oars are prodigiously long things. You know, you, they need to be serious bits of kit and you'll spend as much on them as you would on a second-hand outboard. But you will feel spiritually sound in comparison to turning up. And it's peaceful. It's lovely and peaceful, rowing. 
tying up to quaysides. This is, happens an awful lot if you're in a cruising boat. So you've got to sort of tie up to this tidal key, and the, the tide's going to go up and down. And obviously, you can't just sort of simply put one rope up there. You've got to learn how to fasten, tie up to a quayside. You might think this is simple. I frequently spend half an hour. Big tidal key. I was recently in the harbour at um, St. Michael's Mount in Cornwall. And the bollards, you can see bollards there, they were designed for fishing boats. So they were like 50 yards apart. So I had to tie every rope together in the boat to create that arrangement of a, of a line out the stern and a line out the bow. And then you need a third. You need at least one spring to hold the boat triangulated against the bank. And it's a really satisfying thing to do. And as I say, it's part of this whole world of, of extra techniques unknown to racing dinghy sailors that we cruisers know about. Sculling, yes, there's a good one. Extremely good way of moving a boat along. You can have your sculling or sticking out the back and then if you could sort of get stuck in stays or there's something you just, you know, do a bit, quick bit of that as compared to putting oars out, really worth learning how to do. Huge numbers of people say they've tried it and they didn't learn, but Alistair Law, who's probably somewhere around here, he has a boat that he can only propel like that. He can't set oars. And he says the thing to do, you just set off on a, with an offshore wind in a boat with only a sculling oar, and he says, after half an hour, you'll have learned how to get back. Either that, of course, you'll be lost at sea, but yeah, you, know, you just have to persevere. And it's like riding a bike. You just suddenly discover the technique, which is all in the wrist action. Diagram of wrist action. It, there's a whole talk in sculling, but it really is an extremely satisfying thing to do. And if you do it, people will just, I mean, they'll just go, look at that. He's moving his boat along with one oar. Um, sometimes this is a muddy creek in the Ile d'Aix on the uh, west coast of France, and I'm sort of poling my way up it, and it got shallower and shallower. So I was sculling with this very muddy sculling oar, and then it got too shallow to do that, so I'm poling along, poling boats along through the mud. There's a whole story about that. This is um, last summer, me and Mary, who's there, and this is my boat. We went to the Marais Poitevin, and we thought we'll explore the Marais Poitevin. It's a sort of whole area of marshland with rivers and locks. And um, we came across a lock, a major lock we needed to go through, and it was all being repaired. So we thought, oh, no, no, what we'll do is, Mary still hasn't forgiven me for this. I said, look, there's this little blue line on the, on the map. We could go up there for a kilometre, and we'll get to another canal. So we did it, and this was it. We were poling our way up this river. There were still twigs in the boat from doing this. It, that was a clear bit. It got worse than that. We were... And when we, after the kilometre, this is the canal we got to, which is choked with weeds. So again, we couldn't row or scull or do anything. We certainly couldn't sail. And um, we didn't really want to put the mast up because there were lots of low bridges. So this is an oar in the bows of the boat. And that's Mary on the, on the towpath, look. So and this was about four kilometers we did this until we got to a little village. Uh, yeah, you're going, you're, this is exciting. Trust me, this is really nice things to do. You're thinking, oh God, we're going to end up pulling the boat along from towpaths. Anchoring. There's another thing. You really need two anchors in a cruising dinghy so you can anchor bow and stern. This is um, the Ile de Breja on, in Brittany. There's a lovely little harbour. Um, and my dinghy moored bow and stern looks. So you need two anchors to do that. It means you can stay put and you know you weigh up that there's a nice flat bit of bottom, so at low tide you're going to end up on it and you don't want the boat to drift around in another direction, so you anchors bow and stern. Um, all sorts of things you can then do with two anchors, and uh, set them up in tandem, you know, in enfilade if it's a really rough sea, or do the, what I call the Pythagorean mooring, which is where you arrive on a beach and you don't want to just leave the boat on the beach because the tide's going out. You want to go ashore and go to the pub or something. So there is this technique of, of taking the boat off the beach with, 
using um, Pythagoras, basically. Um, so this is us um, anchored. There is an anchor out the stern. You can't see the rope. This is on the Ely Lure. My dinghy is called Nilua. It's the class, as it were. And there is actually, it's named after the Ely Ilure on the Gulf de Morbihan. And that is the Ely Ilure. So there we are. And again, you see what I mean. We've just gone to a bit of wilderness and, and we're spending the night there. I am going to mention toilets now. Because last time I gave a talk, the last question was about, well, how do you go to the toilet? And it, I didn't want to end with that. But I'm also mindful of when you read Arthur Ransom books, you know, like Swallows and Amazons, the children never go to the toilet at all. You think, well, how did, how did that work? And I'm... And it is, and sometimes I get, I get people come up and they say, oh, well, I, I'd like to do dinghy cruising, but my girlfriend wouldn't, because she doesn't, the idea of going to the toilet in the open, no. And I do sort of think that the world is divided into two sorts of people. Those who never move more than about 100 yards from a toilet. So they never, they never have to deal with this problem, or people who sort of, you know, if you go hill walking or do anything, active in the countryside, you have to deal with, you know, doing it in the landscape. And I actually think, I am going to say, that it is important to move more than 100 yards from a toilet, and you just have to deal with it. Deal with it, people. Bucket. You use a bucket. Okay, so moving on, and then you can go to places like that. Um, yeah, boat rollers has, these are two guys who did the Northwest Passage in a dinghy and they brought the boat ashore most nights on, on rollers. Another technique. Oh, and navigation. There's a whole subject of navigation. I won't really cover that, but you do, even in a dinghy, you're properly navigating. So tides and currents and all that sort of stuff. It's just the same as yachts. Even more so, because we very often don't have engines, so we really, really are working the tides. Going places. Um, I should be... I'm going to rush through. Places you can go to. Sweden. More Sweden. This is um, a little island south, off the south coast of Britain called the Ilo Mouton. All there is is lots of birds and a lighthouse. Boat festivals, cruising dinghies go to boat festivals. This is a wonderful one on the Gulf de Morbihan. Oh, this is actually the Maripoite van again. Uh, four of us rode down this ship canal and went into the sea. Lots of, we were all camping on board, little cruising dinghies. This is the Prefecture in Camper. I went all the way up the river and moored here. There's a sort of nice sort of boulevard sort of thing you can do in a cruising dinghy. It's not all wilderness, it's the centre of town as well. Um, yeah, on a muddy beach, and in Brittany. This is Clavelli. Wonderful place, Clavelli. Look, this is Clavelli. Do you see any white yachts? Do you see a marina? No, you don't. You see one cruising dinghy and fishing boats. It's just the north coast of Devon. It's extraordinary, a pub. Cruising dinghy, pub. It's like heaven, isn't it? It's just summed up in that picture. Uh, this is Clavelli as well. It's lived in just by local people because the owner of the village won't allow people who don't have local employment to live there. So this guy is the harbour master and a local fisherman, and he lives in that house. You can, cruising Ningi, go to Clavelli. This is Lundy. It's again in the same area, obviously. This is our cruising Ningi. That pulling back, this is where we are, that's Lundy. This is just off the north coast of Devon. You could be anywhere. This is what I mean. Cruising dinghy, getting out into the savage landscape again. Do you see a marina? Do you see any big white yachts? No. Do you see any racing dinghies? No. Little Creek in Wales. Right, very quickly at the end before we do the questions. People say, have you ever capsized? For ages, I hadn't really. And then I had the year of the capsizes. Um, two years ago, there was two capsizes, so, which was very salutary. And the second one was when a journalist from this French magazine, Le Chasse Marais, 
arrived and wanted to write about me, and we thought we'd better take him somewhere exciting like Lundy. So um, we set out, this is his photograph, we set out from Appledore on the north coast of Devon, and uh, Alistair Law in his little green boat was there as well, so there were actually two boats. And we went out over Biddeford Bar, sailed along the coast to Clavelli again. So here we are in Clavelli. This is my boat, and here's Alistair's little green boat in the harbour. Again, notice they still haven't built a marina, and there are still no big white yachts, and we're still the only visiting boats other than the local fishing fleet. It's the north coast of Devon, people. It's not like, you know, the back of beyond. And then the next day, I have to say, there was a long discussion with the uh, local harbour master and indeed the coxswain of the local lifeboats about what we should do because the lifeboats had been out and we knew there was a one and a half metre swell in the bay and we knew it was westerly, so we, Biddyford Bar was going to have waves on it. But we all decided, no, that would be fine. So we set off to sail back. We've got three reefs in the sail there. And then off the bar, this is off the bar, we changed it, we had to have a little storm sail. So we set the storm sail and then went in over the bar. And they, the, we sent Alistair in first, I have to say. We in our boat, we thought we'll send him in first. And if he dies, maybe we'll go somewhere else. But there isn't really anywhere else to go in. The Bristol Channel is very low on sheltered harbours that don't dry or and there's really nasty swift tides. Anyway, we actually capsized. We did actually get knocked over on the, on the bar in our boat, and we righted the boat and got to sailing again, and then the next wave took us surfing in towards the beach, because you got the sort of turn right to get into Appledore. So we were, we were seeing this beach, and it was coming up, you know, like that, and we were thinking, whoo! And we were surfing at 17 knots, yeah, he's telling a story, you're saying. No, the GPS chart plotter trace 17 knots. The whole boat vibrated and we were surfing down on the foam. And at that point, I thought, if we end up, and I was thinking of Jack, the journalist's children, I think if we end up on that beach, we, we may not get ashore through the surf. And it'd be really nice if there was just a lifeboat just there. And we could actually see a lifeboat because the Appledore lifeboat was in sight. So I did, first time I've ever done in my life, we actually put out a mayday call. And the lifeboat, they sent both lifeboats. We had two lifeboats. Actually, we didn't need them because by the time they'd arrived, we'd actually were fine and we were over the worst bit. But, so this is um, actually a picture from Le Chasse Marais, double page spread. This is Jacques, the journalist, looking very wet steering my boat, and this is the inshore lifeboat, the Appledore inshore lifeboat. Um, I don't do this sort of about false bravado, but the thing is that talking to lifeboatmen, they much prefer to be called out early and being not needed than being called out late and picking bodies out of the sea, you know. And there is a sort of responsibility not to be too proud to, to call for help if you need it. That is the end of the presentation. There you are, the Dinghusing Association. We have this wonderful magazine. I wrote a book, um, which you can buy from Amazon, but not from me, because I failed to order copies in time. And um, there you are, thank you very much. Do. Oh, brilliant, Roger. Great stories and, and a fantastic storyteller. I feel slightly sorry for Mary. We never actually saw her face. Not entirely sure. <laughs> Mary is here. <laughs> Do you actually enjoy it, Mary? No. No, double thumbs up. There we go. We have, we have five minutes, I guess, for any questions. Anyone tempted in the audience? Any questions for Roger? Oh, we get my, my son asked me m midway through the talk, is that a keelboat? I mean, no one could believe that you might actually take, take to the high seas in mm. a dinghy. How did you, tell me, how did you manage to write it? Um, well, we, what happened is, um, because uh, as I was describing, we were trying to sort of head around to the right, so we weren't completely perpendicular to these 
seas, which were sort of you know, 10, 16 meters high. We weren't looking back at them, but Alistair says they were, you know, and we were vanishing out of sight, obviously, because he, he went over one and vanished and then merged, you know, it's all like that. But only a little brief bit. It is a really, really dodgy bar, is, is uh, Biddy for Bar. And um, so the crest of one of the waves just tripped the boat up, just lifted the stern and the bow dug in and threw us out. So we fell into the water. The boat came over on side and just righted herself. So we ended up swimming beside the boat with the sail in the water because we had the sail down. So the whole sail fell out because the little sail was still up. And we just sort of clambered back on board. And then Jack did lots of bailing with the bucket. And I went, you know, and then we got the surfing bit. And then we sort of called out the, um, yeah, the Coast Guard. And the thing is that there, it was Swansea Coast Guard. And, and there was this very nice woman with a Welsh accent. And she still is sitting in this office. And this Mayday call comes in. And you, you do this, you know, there's a standard Mayday call routine. And then they, then they engage you in conversation. They actually, they're clearly taught to do this to calm you down. So I'm sort of talking on the VHF with this hand and staying with this hand and thinking, and I had to say to her, look, I'm going to have to put the radio down because I am actually steering in very big waves. So, yeah. And Roger, I'm dying to know what 2019's big adventure is going to be. Oh, uh, yeah, I wish I knew. I'll tell you when it happens. I haven't <laughs> planned 2019 yet. It was enough stress coming to this boat show. <laughs> And, and vacuuming the twigs out of the boat from, um, from the escapade in the Mare Poitiers Van. Anyway, thank you. It's Roger, nice it's been you. fantastic. I'm sure you all agree. Roger Barnes, what a great talker, great storyteller. Thank you. Thank you.